Hey, good morning. Man, thanks so much for being here today. Really glad you guys are here. We are in our, uh, we are in our second week of, um, of David. Somebody's like, dude, you're in a suit today. I was like, man, we're all business today, man. We're going to get after it. We're going to have fun. And next week we'll be in jeans and it'll be awesome too. So, all right, anyway. Hey, man, we, uh, uh, we're in the second week of David. And if this is your first week, this is what you missed. Last week, we covered 500 years in like 25 minutes. I was exhausted by the time it was over. I bet you were too. 500 years, 25 minutes. We're just looking at one chapter today. Thank God for that, man. That's a good thing, dude. Whew. I felt like jet lag, man. It was crazy. All right, so here's what you missed if you missed last week. Um, you missed 500 years of history. But um, we talked about last week, like, how we got to David. Like, like, you know, we read about King David, and we celebrate parts of his life and how God used him. But last week we talked about how. And just as important as we talked about, like, why. Like, why did God choose King David? And we talked about his heart. God clearly said, listen, I know that everybody's looking at the outside. I'm not concerned with the outside. I'm looking at the inside. I care what's going on with their heart. And David had a heart after God. And, man, we get to see this modeled a little bit last week in David's life. You see David is a shepherd, and he was an awesome shepherd. And God looked down out of all the people in Israel, out of all the people that he could pick, and he saw this shepherd. And he saw this kid. And he thought, man, if this kid will go to that length to take care of the sheep that have been entrusted to him, imagine how I could use him to take care of my people. And so God saw a young man with a heart after him, and he saw a care for the sheep, and he's like, I can use that. I can use that to lead my people back to to me. And so that's what we talked about last week. Now today we're going to take our next step, and it's a little more well known. Actually, it's one of the more uh, the more well known uh, events in David's life is when David fights Goliath. And if you grew up hearing about it, you know how the story ends. And if you're here and you've never heard the story of Goliath, well, I'm not going to spoil it for you because it is absolutely riveting. Whether you're hearing it for the first time or whether you're hearing it for the 150th time, it's awesome. But here's what I also want to let you know, is that there are so many subplots and neat things going on beneath the scenes that sets this whole stage up, that makes this battle absolutely riveting. Um, and I'll just, I'll just give you a little bit of teaser. Here's, here's one of the things. Um, back in the Old Testament, what we read is that the Holy Spirit did not dwell. Our bodies were not a temple where the Spirit of God dwelled. In the Old Testament, once they built the temple, that's where the Spirit of God dwelled. And so if you go back to the book of Judges, you remember a guy named Samson. And Samson would go out and he would fight a group of people known as the? Philistines. Oh, you guys are on it. Awesome. And that was like the best response all weekend. Kudos to 1045. If you're joining us on the screen today, like you are the best, loudest, most participatory way to go. All right. So, man, and what we read is, is that when Samson would go out to fight the Philistines, you would always read this phrase, and the spirit of the Lord would come upon him, he would go out, and he would be victorious. But we remember that, man, he did something that he wasn't supposed to do. He told Delilah the secret of his strength, and we read that after that, the spirit of the Lord departed Samson, and he went out, and he thought he was going to be victorious like he'd always been victorious before but he wasn't. They took him captive. Here is what is fascinating about the whole precursor to David and Goliath. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 4, we read that the spirit of the Lord had departed Saul. You have a godless king. God is not going out to fight for that, that person, that king, and yet this king takes his armies out to go fight the Philistines. And he doesn't know it, but everybody's going to know it in a big time hurry that they are fighting a losing battle. And we'll see that in the story. We'll see that. And remember, this isn't just some bedtime story. This isn't some Sunday school time story. These are real people happening in real time, real events. Turn with me now to 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we're going to see what is going on. 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting in verse 3. We read that the Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with a valley in between them. Philistines occupy one hill, the Israelites another with a valley in between them. I want to show you a cool picture so that you can just, as we read this, so that you can just kind of enjoy the historical context of the moment. Uh, Coming up on the screen here is going to be a picture of those two hills. Now, a fascinating fact about Israel 
is that is, the Israelis have planted today 90% of the trees. And so the trees that you see on these hills were not there at the time of Samson, or were not there at the time of David and Goliath. Okay, they've been planted since then. But this is actually the hill that the Philistine army, if I can get this, my pen went out. The one in the, in the background there, that hill in the background, uh, that's the one that the Philistines were on. And this one in the foreground here is this little, this little knoll. That's where the Israelite army would be on. And it would be more barren and their tents would have been camped out everywhere. And so with this little knoll closest to us, you can just imagine as we're going to read today that when David goes out to see the army to deliver some things to, uh, to his brothers in the army, he would have come up the backside of this hill and he would have been in there with all the armies of Israel and he would have looked across that valley in the middle and he would have seen all the Philistine armies. So that's the setting for the confrontation that we're going to look at today. Well, let's just go ahead and see what would happen. So if you can imagine looking at that screen, the hill on the background, the Philistines are there, and there's this guy, his name's Goliath, and he, he comes down that hill, and he begins to shout, verse, uh, sorry, a champion named Goliath, verse 4, who was from Gath. He was out of the Philistine camp, and he was over nine feet tall. Now, I've heard a lot of different pastors say in a lot of different ways, try to explain Goliath. So I'm going to take my best crack at it. He's huge. <laughs> How do you describe somebody nine foot? Man, like when he gets out there and shout, I'm sure his voice is a whole lot deeper than mine can ever get. But I mean, dude, he's massive. You can't describe nine feet tall unless you've seen it, man. And this dude comes down there and he begins shouting at him in the, the, the army of Israel. The army is freaking out because this guy is huge. All right, now look at Verse 8, Goliath stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not the servants of Saul? That is, you know, you read that, this is absolutely riveting to me because the Israeli people, the Hebrew people are servants of the living God. They're God's people. God is their king and yet Goliath has said a mouthful more than he ever knows. He goes, aren't you servants of Saul? And I'll tell you what, if you've got to choose between being a servant of Saul and being a servant of God, you want to choose an heir on the side of God. I'm just telling you based on what we're going to see here. So aren't you servant of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down here to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we'll become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and they were terrified. How do we know that God isn't with Saul and how do we know that Saul is, or God isn't with this army? Because they're running from a man. Have they ever had to run from a man before? No, because God always went before them. And didn't we just sing a song about that? Like God was always with them. And here they are terrified. How do we know they're terrified? Well, let's look down at verse 16. For 40 days, for 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and evening. He took his stand. For 40 days, Goliath would come down there being Mr. Big, and he would taunt him. And he would put fear in them. And for 40 days, they would listen and they'd be disheartened and they'd tremble with fear. And now let's just make this really personal. Each and every one of us in here, starting with me, has a giant in their life. We all have a giant. And we wouldn't say he might be nine foot tall, but we'd probably agree it's huge. And every morning when we wake up, he whispers in our ear, you can't win. Your God doesn't care. Your God isn't big enough. And those giants have a name. The giant could be a giant of insecurity. Maybe your giant is a financial giant. And every day says, you'll never dig out. You'll never dig out. God doesn't care about you. Maybe it's insecurity. He says, man, 
you don't matter. God doesn't care. He's not listening. Man, maybe, maybe your giant is like time management. You're not, you're not getting time with God during the week, and he taunts, and he's like, see, man, I can just keep you busy enough and keep you spinning all week long. We all have a giant, and your giant has a name, and your giant is like Goliath in the fact that it's huge and, and that it's, it's brash and it's bold and it's wicked, and it just taunts you day after day after day. If you're taking notes this morning, this is what I want to tell you. Is the battle that we find ourselves in is often more spiritual in nature than we think. Now, if you look at the battle between David and Goliath, if you look at the battle between Israel and the Philistines in this setting right here, it just looks like a physical throwdown. It just looks like a fight. It looks like a fight that's been happening for a long time. It just looks like two armies are coming out and they're going to beat on each other. It looks physical in nature. I mean, everything about it screams, this is just a fight. This is just a fight. It is a fight, but it's way more spiritual in nature than what it looks like on the outside. And oftentimes the fights with the giants in our lives are often more spiritual in nature than we think. And so let me just kind of look at this a little bit. The, the spiritual nature in this battle is that the, the nation of Israel is looking to a man to deliver them against their enemies. They keep looking to a man to say, go down and beat that guy. And what's happening? For 40 days, they're sitting there in fear. These are God's people. Did he choose them to be a picture to the world of what fear looks like? No, the Hebrew people are a people who God has specifically chosen to be a picture to the entire world of what it looks like to be in relationship with him. And so the fact that they're running, the fact that they're hiding and screaming, this thing is this, this thing, spiritual in nature. Something's wrong. God's people are afraid. Isn't fear, isn't that a tool of the devil? Like doesn't the enemy want to hold us in fear so that we don't move forward? Forward, that we don't take the that we don't slay the giants in our lives that's exactly what's happening and i would dare guess when it comes to the giant or giants in your life that there is a part of that fight that is more spiritual in nature than maybe even what you thought when you heard the first whisper this morning and so let me ask you a clarifying question what is the spiritual implications or what are the spiritual implications of the, of the battle against the giant in your life? When you're facing that giant, what are the spiritual implications? Let's just look at that for a minute. Let's just say for a minute that your giant is an addiction of some sort. If the giant whispers to you day after day, you can't overcome this. You'll never overcome this. This thing's got you licked. Well, let's go back for a minute. Let's just be honest. The enemy isn't afraid of you. The enemy isn't afraid of me. So what do giants do in our lives? They come out and they're big and they're bold and they're brash and they say, you can't do this. They try to get you to focus on you. They try to get, the enemy tries to get me to focus on me and what I can do. The enemy's not afraid of us. But the enemy is afraid of us of God. And if your, if your giant, if your giant was, um, was addiction and the enemy could say, you can't overcome this, well, maybe if he could believe you that, believe, get you to believe that you can't overcome it and get you focused there, then maybe he could, he could get your attention off the fact that God could set you free, that God wants to set you free, that God has the power to set you free. Because if you can see that then that giant in your life all of a sudden isn't so scary because it's not what you can do. It's what the God who loves you can do. And you know that if God can take that giant down, if you know that God can, can purchase your eternal freedom on a cross, then taking that giant in your life, taking that down, easy. But we got to get the attention off ourselves. We're looking, if, if that giant can get us to look at the wrong thing, us, he can stay in our lives. You see, the battles that we find ourselves are often more spiritual in nature than we would ever think. And we just got done singing this song, uh, God, you are good. God, you are good. But let's just pretend for a moment that the enemy, the giant in your life is maybe apathy. 
And so this morning you came in and your heart's not hard towards God, but it's not really warm either. And you're just sitting there like, you are good. Oh, oh. Like, when is it going to be over? What's the spiritual implication of that? Is that you're missing out, and we all go through seasons, but you'd be missing out on God's specific and divine and dear love for you. And God wants you to experience that. And the implication is if you stay there, you're going to miss out on God's goodness. And you're probably not going to praise his goodness all the live long day, wherever you go. And when you talk about him, you're like, oh yeah, he's good. It's just not very attractive. There's some spiritual implications. The whole thing that I'm trying to just really drive home, you guys, is that the battle against your giant, there are oftentimes more spiritual in nature than we would ever think. So let's just move on to verse 17 because I find this fascinating. Now Jesse, that's David's dad, said to his son David, take this ephah of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to the camp. Take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of the unit and see how your brothers are and bring them back some assurance or bring back some assurance from them. They're with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. I want to point something out here. Do you see what David did? His dad asked him to go and check on his brothers. Yes, are we good so far? His dad asked him to bring some things to his brothers. We, following with me so far? Okay, let me point this out. You want to know why David, you want to know why God picked David? Humility. Humility. His dad asked him to do it and he just said, okay. He obeyed. And God, looking down, sees a humble servant. And man, there's something beautiful about humility. And, and God knew if David's willing to obey his father, he's going to be willing to obey me too. Humility. Why, David? Because of his humility. And there's a lesson in there for us. Listen, if we got a hard time being humble with people that we can see, we're going to have a hard time. If we, if we can't be humble with the folks we can see, we're going to have a hard time being humble with the God that we can't see. And he's going to make some asks, and he's going to make some requests, and he's going to give us an invitation to join him in some of the works that he's doing. But if we don't have a humble heart, if we're not willing, we're going to miss out on God's best for us. And don't think, well, I can be humble with God, but I don't have to be humble over here. No, 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 no. The two are connected. God's looking at that heart. Humility matters. And have you ever tried to, David is 15 years old at this time. He's 15 years old when his dad's asking him to do this. He's 15 years old when he goes and he, and he slays Goliath. Have you ever tried to reason with a teenager before? I love to play this out in my head. Like, because what if this would have gone the other way? What if David wouldn't have been humble? And Jesse's like, hey, I want you to take this grain and I want you to take these 10 cheeses and I want you to check on the brother. I love playing this out. This is so funny because he, he, he could go, uh, Dad, were you there the day this dude named Samuel showed up and anointed, hold on, wait for it, Dad, me king? Sorry, Pop, I'm not doing it. Because last time I checked, I'm king. You go do it. But he didn't do that. He didn't do that. He was humble. But man, if he wasn't, he could have totally done that. So the fact that David does this, I'm just telling you, it proves the power of humility. He's totally available for God to use. And the question this morning is, are you humble? Are you totally available for God to use? And your humility and what people would say would speak to it. This humility thing is a big, big deal. Don't miss out on this. It's going to make them available in this battle that's about to take place. And what are these? I mean, look at even his response. The battles are often more spiritual in nature than what we would ever think. So let's. Uh, so early in the morning, verse twenty, David left the flock as shepherd uh, with another shepherd. He loaded up, set out as Jesse, his father, had directed, and he reached the camp. The army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. This is funny and sad. For forty days, the Israelite army goes out and they do a battle cry. They go out to their little mountaintop and they look over at the Philistines and they go, raw. For 40 days, the Philistines haven't seen them do anything but run. They're like, ooh, that's a pretty good one today. Hey, Goliath, why don't you go down there? Okay. And they take off running. That's funny. 
David shows up for 40 days. They've been doing a battle cry and nothing's happening. How do we know that this is more spiritual in nature? Nothing's going on. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up the lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper and supplies. He ran to the battle lines and greeted his brothers. Verse 23. As he was talking with them, Goliath the Philistine, the champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and he shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He, co- he keeps coming out to defy Israel? The king will give him great wealth to the man who kills him. He'll also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. David asked the, man, the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills the Philistine and removes this, this disgrace from Israel? Then I love this question. Hey, who's this uncircumcised Philistine? Who's that big guy down there? That he should defy the armies of the living God. I want us to look at two verses. I want us to look at verse 25 and I want us to look at verse 26. Because this is key to winning the the battle against the giant in your life. You see the Israelites, they're saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He he, He keeps coming out to defy Israel. They're making this about them. They're fixated on them, and the enemy's not scared of them. But David comes out, and he's like, who's this uncircumcised Philistine that he should dare to fight the armies of the living God? Don't these people know what God's been doing doing to them for centuries? Have they forgotten who God is? Like, David has got this completely different perspective. He's like, man, how dare these guys come and try to take ground and insult our God? How dare they do that? And I want to tell you something when the, when the giants in our lives, oftentimes we're like, man, don't come, like, don't pick on me, don't come against me, when our attitude ought to be, how dare you, enemy, come against the God who saved my soul? How dare you come against this area in my life that God has freed me from? He set me free from that. That thing no longer controls me. How dare you? Come against me. Not me, against God. That's the perspective. And if you want to start slaying the giants in your life, that's the perspective that you've got to take. And I'm going to tell you this. Perspective is paramount to victory over the giants in your lives. Because if you come at perspective with a heart full of humility and faith and trust in God, it's going to help you have a perspective for success. That type of perspective says, man, you can taunt me all day, but don't you dare. Don't you dare come come against the God who set me free. I'll tell you what, the enemy will run from that. The giant will fall. The giant will flee. Perspective is paramount to winning the battles against these giants in our life. So Saul hears that... um, David is in camp, and that David's asking these questions. And so he says, hey, man, bring, bring that kid over to me because I want to hear what he's talking about. And they begin this conversation, and we get, we get in, invited into the conversation in verse 32. And David says to Saul, let nobody lose heart. Let nobody lose heart on account of this Philistine. For 40 days they've been losing heart. They've been terrified. They've been running. And David, a 15-year-old kid comes in there, and let me tell you something. If you've ever watched a 15-year-old kid play, if you've ever seen them imaginary, like, beat up bad guys in their imagination, what do they all believe? They're going to win. They're like, I'm going to beat this guy. David's like, I'm going to beat this guy. And Saul's in his 40s, 50s. There's stronger men. There's tougher men. And here comes a boy into camp, a teenager, and he's saying, hey, uh, don't worry. Don't lose heart. But Saul replied to him, you're not able to go out against the Philistine and fight. You're only a boy. And Goliath is a man, he's a fighting man from his youth. But David said to Saul, I love this, this is so cool. And this is only verse 34, but this is awesome. David said to Saul, well, your servant's been keeping his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went after it. Let me tell you something. If I'm a shepherd and a bear or lion comes after the sheep, I'm praying for a quick, swift death for that sheep, man. Because I got more. But not David. 
David goes after it. That's awesome. That is cool. All right. He goes, so he doesn't just go after it. Look, he goes, I struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. Awesome. But hey, Saul, when I did that, like the bear and the lion, they turned on me. And when they turned on me, I seized it. Okay, if I, if I in some crazy moment went after the sheep and that thing turned on me, I'm putting as many sheep between me and the, the bear or the lion as I possibly can, okay? I mean, I, not David. Not David. This dude is courageous, man. Look at this. He says, when it turned on me, I seized it by its hair. I struck it and I killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Why? Because he's defied the armies of the living God. His perspective is right on. And then check this out. His perspective continues. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Hey, listen, God was with me when that bear attacked me, when that lion attacked me. He's going to be with me when I went down there. And oh, by the way, you're looking down there at a man. Dude, I've had a bear attack me and God helped me beat it. And I've had a lion come after me and God protected me from it. Yeah, that guy down there, dude, he's just a giant. You're just going to hear a bigger thud when he falls. Dude, Saul's jaw had to just go. So Saul said to David, I love this. Uh, hey, David, go and the Lord be with you. <laughs> go and the Lord be with you. All right, hey, hey, fellas, get out here. You're not going to believe what you're going to see. But then he probably has this moment of guilt because we read in verse 38 what he does. is He starts to put David in his armor. David's like, well, I didn't have this when I fought the bear. I didn't have this when I fought the Fought the lion. Hey, Saul, I don't need this stuff. Like, I can't fight in this. He's like, didn't you hear what I just said? Like, God's going to be with me. Now, we're going to get to the story, but there is a story within the story. Did you see what just happened? Two kings are having a conversation. The kingdom that was and the kingdom that will be. Saul's kingdom has passed. He's forfeited his right to lead. And David has been anointed king. He is a king of the future. His kingdom is going to be yet to come. And these two kings are having a conversation. Which kingdom's going to win? There is something in there for us. Each and every day when that giant comes and fight you, fights, fights and whispers to you, it is the tale of two kingdoms. One that's fighting for ground and one that has already won. So when you lead, when you're having this fight, when this battle against the giant in your life, what heart are you leading with? Are you leading with the heart of Saul? Or are you leading with the heart of David? Because if you're leading with the heart of Saul, you're going to try to get all gussied up and all this other stuff, and you're just going to sit there. But if you're leading with the heart of David, well, hold on, because it's about to get good and the giant's about to fall. When it comes to these giants and when it comes to your perspective, whose heart are you leading with? It's two kingdoms. We already know that one kingdom's one, and it's all about what perspective, and that's how you're going to lead. All right, so let's keep on going here. So David's like, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to go out with God, and he's got a slingshot with him, and um, he's got a shepherd's bag and a sling, and I think he's got some type of staff with him as well. Yeah, he's got a staff in his hand. Verse 41. So while this is all going on, meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked at David over, he looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, that he was ruddy and handsome, and he despised David. He said to David, for 40 days, he's like, been, send me somebody, and they send out a teenager. Goliath should have been freaking out, I'm just saying. And he goes, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'm gonna give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with a sword and you come against me with a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel who you have defied. You want to start slaying the giant or giants in your life? That's how you come at them. 
Man, you say, man, you come at me with all this, but I'm coming against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. And then David said, this day, the Lord is going to hand you over to me, and I'm going to strike you down. And this is manly. I mean, like, this is like testosterone. This is great stuff. This is stuff every person from seven years old to like 80 years old would love to say. He's like, you come against me this way. Today, I'm going to strike you down, and then I'm going to cut your head off. Oh, and Goliath's like, whatever, dude. And David's like, yep, you're about to see it. Okay. Today, I'm going to give the carcasses of the Philistine and the army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And the whole world is going to know that there is a God in Israel. All gathered here today will know that it is not by the sword, the spear, that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's. And he will give all of you into our hands. The battle. Okay, go ahead. That's not for me, that's for God. The spiritual battle you find yourself in, that giant that's in your life, listen, look at what it says. The battle is the Lord's. It belongs to him. It's often more spiritual in nature, but the perspective that you have is absolutely paramount. God is really ready and willing and able to slay that giant. He just needs you to have the right perspective and trust him. And he's ready to give your enemy into your hands. So as the Philistine moves closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle to meet him. I just, it's coming up on the screen. I want you to see that. I want you to underline it. I want you to write it down. As the giant moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. The next time the giant in your life raises up and begins to whisper and begins to shout and be, becomes big and brash, Man, not in your power, not in your strength, and not in your ability, but in God's ability, his availability, his willingness, and in his power, run toward the battle line to meet that giant and say, not today, not in my name, but in the God's name who has saved me, who has liberated me through his son, Jesus. You see, most people look at their giants and we run from them. We never go out to the battle. And that's what's been happening here. And it took some kid with a faith the size of a giant to show the world that there is a God and he's able and he's willing. And so he runs and he runs at that giant, not with, with the faith or not with a huge faith, or sorry, here's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Just read it, man. Just read it. It's right on the paper in front of you. That day in the battle, David ran with the faith of a giant, and he watched a giant with no faith at all fall. Amen. Max Licato says, man, when it comes to rushing that giant, rush your giant with the God-saturated soul. Amen. And when you do that, you watch that giant fall. And so if your giant... It's the giant of depression. You tell that giant. Giant of depression, it may take a lifetime, but you will not conquer me. Giant of divorce, you are not entering my home or my marriage. Giant of bigotry, child abuse, you are going down. Amen. Well, let's read what happens. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and he struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and fell face down on the ground. Had to be an awesome thud. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck him down. God gave the Philistine into David's hand. He stood er, down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. And I like to think that when David stood over him, he said, told you. And he took hold of the Philistine's sword and he drew it from the scabbard and he killed him and he cut off his head with the sword. And when the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and they ran. And then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with the shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and the gates of Ekron. Their dead, uh, their dead were strewn along the, the road from Gath to Ekron close with these, these final thoughts and these final observations that are, all, that are for all of us today. Now, the giant in your life, it can't be killed with a slingshot and a sword. And if you walk around long enough with a slingshot and a sword and twirl it around and wave it around, you're going to jail. <laughs> so how do you beat these giants in your life? Like, what do you got to do? Well, God's given you weapons. Like, you have powerful weapons at your disposal that will slay the giant or giants in your life. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 
2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 through 5. This is what Paul says. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, the weapons we have have divine power to demolish strongholds. And isn't that what giants are? They're strongholds in our life. The weapons that God has given us to slay the giants in our lives have divine power to demolish the giants in our lives. We demolish arguments and we every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Jesus. What are the weapons? They're coming up on the screen. The weapons that are divinely empowered to help you slay the, the giants in your life is prayer. Prayer in Jesus' name is a weapon. God's word is a weapon. Jesus' name, the name of Jesus, is a weapon. Your faith is a weapon. Your trust, your belief in God, it is a weapon to help you slay the giant or giants in your life. The spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead that is living in you has empowered you and gifted you to slay the giants in your life. And then God loves us so much that he also gives us armor to protect us in these battles. And here's a beautiful thing that I love, and it's the last observation from this passage this morning. Is did you see what happened when David slayed the giant? The rest of the army fled. Not because they were afraid of David. Because they were afraid of the God that David served. And did you see what happened to David's army? They engaged for 40 days, they'd been sitting there idle, fearful. And they saw God deliver a decisive victory for them. And their hearts engaged. Their lives engaged. And they went and they took out the rest of the army. And here's the takeaway for each and every one of us. When you go out and you allow God to slay that, slay that giant in your life, when that giant is slain and your friends, the people that are closest to you, the people you're in community with, the ones that know you best, when they see that giant fall, that does something for them. You see, as darkness flees, people's hearts engage. And they're like, hey, I got a giant in my life. How do I beat that giant? And you start talking to, you, to them about how God helped you become victorious and their lives engage. And before you know it, that is a fire that cannot be extinguished. That is a movement that cannot be stopped. And the name of God goes forth and his name is praised and his name is revered. And people turn their apathetic hearts back to him. And all it did is start with a little giant that you knew all along God could beat, you just decided to get serious about it and give it over to him. Amen. Lord God, thank you for each and everybody in here. Lord, I know that you love them in ways that I cannot fathom. I know that you love me in ways that is beyond my ability to form words to speak. So much so that you would give your son Christ to set us free. I know this morning there are giants in this room in each and every one of our lives. And in the power of Jesus' name, who is the one who made a way, not only to, to you, God, but to victory, I pray the giants would fall this week. I pray there would be a chorus of praise reverberating in our hearts and our minds. And I pray the people closest to us would see it. I pray you give us the words to form it. And I pray that in this city known as Casper, Wyoming, a large praise would enter the heavenly realms of how you helped us slay giants in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.